from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Welcome to the eighth and final week of our series entitled Know the Law. For any viewers who were not uh, with us uh, in past programs on this final week, we're going to discuss employment and discrimination, or another way to describe it is labor law and when discrimination <coughs> takes place uh, within that arena. We're very pleased to welcome to the program a good friend and a supporter of this program for years and obviously active in many different fields. Uh, he is an attorney. Uh, we welcome Mr. Bob Brown. Uh, in addition to being an attorney in the state of Idaho, he is a member of the Idaho Commission on the Arts and is the former chair of that commission. He is also a former administrator at North Idaho College, and he wears many other hats that we don't have time to uh, discuss, uh, but it certainly qualifies him uh, to discuss this very important subject in this series that we have been bringing. Uh, on behalf of the panel and our staff, Bob, welcome to the program. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you, Tony. And I'd point out to our viewers, you've been here on a number of other occasions, both as a guest and a panel member in the past, and we're happy to have you with us. We have our two regular panelists today to join in this eighth and final week of this series. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the program Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Steve Sheen, who is the Dean of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College. And I shall ask Janelle Burke to commence the questioning. Bob. Employment law is a very broad area, and I know it's an area that you are experienced in. Can you tell us something about employment law? What does that conjure up in the minds of people when they talk about it? What all of the areas does it encompass? <coughs> well, it usually conjures up the fact, three words, I've been fired, you know, and then what can I do? Uh, employment law is often called labor law, and I prefer the term employment law because to me labor law is really one of the uh, elements that make up employment law, and, and I sort of divide them very roughly with labor law would be uh, that kind of law dealing with uh, usually organized groups who have arranged some kind of a contract with their employer, and it's most frequently obviously a labor union. <coughs> and those kind of negotiations and so forth are a separate area of the law all by itself. More common, especially today with, with some of the decline of membership in the labor unions, is what I would just call employment law. And that is a situation where an employee has a relationship with an employer and it's usually one uh, and, and one. Uh, there are some organizations of employees and so forth that are not labor unions that do in fact make contracts. And uh, an example of this might be a group at a school or something, teachers is a, a form of a really good example. Although they now call a lot of the public school like the Idaho Education Association, they call that, you know, a labor union sometimes in the paper. It's not technically, it's a professional association. But then <clears throat> when you have the individual, however, then you have a whole area of law that I call discrimination law. And this would involve sex, age, race, ethnic origin, disabilities, uh, all of the protected statuses. Some states have ones on sexual orientation. The, the, it, the list is very long of what we call protected classes. Then you have an area of the law that is uh, employment law, federally mandated usually, things like Child Labor Act, Fair Labor Standards Act, Wage and Hours. All of these things ap apply to employment, and many of the cases that I get, for example, involve some apparent violation of some of these uh, basic federal laws. And then the final area would be simply that of an employee who has been discharged by his employer and feel that, feels that he was wrongfully discharged and comes to an attorney or whatever with the idea of, I've been fired, what can I do? Do I have any, any rights? Steve Sheen. Bob, how, do the, how does the state of Idaho uh, differ from other states in terms uh, of those categories you just mentioned? I mean, this is, a, I believe, a right to work state. How does that? Okay. The right to work is actually refers back to the labor unions. That is to say that in a right to work state, employees have a have a, a right to work 
in a uh, for an employer without joining a labor union, without being forced to. The, I think the phrase that you're probably uh, thinking of that a lot of people don't quite understand is employment at will. Employment at will and right to work really are two totally separate things. Employment at will means that an employee can come into his boss at the height of the, his busiest season, you know, Christmas Eve at uh, Toys R Us and say, I've decided to quit and I'm quitting right now. And the employee says, no, no, you can't quit. I mean, there are a hundred uh, mothers and fathers out there waiting for your services and they can walk away from the job. Now, realistically, employment at will is rarely used by the employee, although many times people quit. But the most frequent uh, complaints that we get is when the employer will say to a, an employee who may have been working there for 10, 12 years, say, I'm, I'd like to inform you that after, in two weeks you will no longer be employed by us. Well, that employee who's never had, let's say, a bad evaluation, has never had any difficulty on the job, has never had his or her competence question, they're baffled. They, can, they can't imagine that an employer can just fire them without giving them any reason. But in Idaho, that is the, the basic employment rule in employment law is employment at will. And the employee can quit basically whenever they choose. And an employer can discharge someone for virtually any reason they want to except the protected areas. So for example, taking the three of you, if you all worked for me, I could come in one day and say, Tony, uh, uh, you know, as you know, most of us who work here are Baptist, and I know that you're a Catholic, and I'd like to just keep our place sort of restricted to Baptist, and so I'm going to have to let you go. And Janelle, you know, we have mostly men here doing these jobs, and you've been a good employee, but I think we'd like to sort of keep this for men. And Steve, I think that's a hideous tie, <laughs> and you're fired because I, I can't stand that tie. Now, Very all three tie. probably seem equally unfair to you, but in reality, Tony would have a case because of, of the protected religious class. Janelle would certainly have a case because of the protected uh, sex. And my case your would be case, an outrage down. against good taste, but it would be <laughs> perfectly legal. For it, the you would be out of luck because <laughs> the employer actually can fire you for, for wearing uh, a bad tie. Now, as long as that is the actual reason and not what we call a pretextual reason. For example, if I really want you gone because you have a, some disability that while it doesn't keep you from doing your job, it's, it's annoying to me or I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable around people who are blind or deaf or whatever it may be, although you're doing your job fine. So I say to you that I'm firing you because of your tie but in reality, you know because of previous conduct on my part or something that it's really a pretext. And so I'm trying to set up where there were actual, uh, and, and not many employers these days are quite so uh, uh, insensitive and, and, and stupid as to say to someone, I'm going to you know, hire a man instead of a woman. Although I presently have a case where the employer said just that <laughs> to, a, to a, a lady employee. Bob, for those viewers out there, some are employers and some are employees, and uh, listening to our program and, and, and in many cases wanting to do what is proper and so forth, it, to be of assistance to both the employer and employee, they need to be informed, and of course they, they you know, a lot of times have their own attorney and so forth, but they need to be informed of what the uh, laws are. And so would you kind of take us through uh, first uh, the idea of what uh, the federal law uh, mandates, and then, uh, or I'll put it this way, they must be cognizant of what the federal laws state concerning discrimination, and then it's also important, is it, not to look at their state laws, and then in some cases, don't they have even city and, and local ordinances? In other words, there may be three places they may have to go to find out what the uh, regulations are. Now, to answer your question, I'm assuming this is a 36-hour show. Yes, and <laughs> we'll continue uh, 35 later. Tony, that question is a good one, but it really is uh, an extreme, <laughs> what you just asked uh, would be almost virtually impossible to try to, to list, but I, I, let me give you a very general answer. There are a set of federal laws involving various kinds of employment discrimination that is not permitted. These laws apply to all um, levels of government, whether it be federal, state, municipal, even like highway districts and so forth. Any uh, state activity 
and by state I'm talking about on behalf of the state is, is all usually covered. Most of the federal legislation that you hear about does not affect private employers and this causes probably the greatest area of concern for people is that they're never sure when they're covered and when they're not. Now for example a private employer under the Fair Labor Standards Act is not covered unless he or she has, and, I, and I, I'm just for the top of my head, I think it's 25 employees. Can uh, I interrupt to say sure. that, that but any corporation or employer that has 25 or more employees is covered? Is covered, the, right. But it's, it's with less employment. Right, and so people hear about the high profile cases and it, the same exact thing could happen to them working for a hamburger place in Coeur d'Alene that has four employees and they would not necessarily be protected. Now some of the laws apply to every employer. The ones I mentioned about race, sex, and so those apply virtually to every employer. Even below 20. Even below. But, but the law, each law really stands alone and that's why I'm a little bit hesitant right, to sure. say I, I hope that anyone who's listening would, if they, if they have a, a specific question about their company, should contact their own attorney because the uh, statements I'm making are very general and very broad, but, but there are state laws in some states that are more restrictive than the federal. Idaho is not in that group. Idaho's laws tend to be no more restrictive than the federal. So one, one point of clarification sure. for viewers is uh, because of the supremacy of the U.S. Constitution and federal law, a state law would have to give at least the same coverage but could give more extensive protection. Right. There are states that have have gone beyond the federal law and protected more people or people in more restricted circumstances. You cannot give less protection, but you can always give more. Some cities, as you pointed out, Seattle is one example that comes to mind. Seattle has added to their civil rights uh, grouping sexual orientation. Now the state of Washington, and I'm not positive about this, but, but I know there are cities that have done this where the states have not. Washington may also have that, but I'm, as an example, a city could have that for city employment that would go beyond what the state has or what the federal government has. But uh, in general, most of the states follow the, f the federal guidelines. So on areas of discrimination, sexual harassment, and so forth, the federal guidelines are, are most often used as the, with the states Thank as well. you. That was real helpful. Okay. I know it's, it's a tremendous area of law recovery. Let me get into one other area and then I'll move back to the panel. <clears throat> in addition to discussing discrimination and so far our discussion has been basically confined to being dismissed or fired, but also there's areas of discrimination in which the employee is actually not fired. I'm sp thinking in particular of sexual harassment, mm -hmm. but also the employee has a case in those areas. Would you give us a little bit of brief description okay. on the uh, uh, sexual harassment, uh, and I guess because of the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill uh, hearings, has absolutely uh, just skyrocketed. I'm not sure the amount has skyrocketed. I think the reporting has skyrocketed. Uh, those hearings probably did more for, to make, uh, especially women, since they are the, the most uh, uh, frequent victims in this, uh, aware that they do have rights. And I have a number of calls, as many attorneys in, in town do, on sexual harassment. Uh, those are very difficult cases in a private employment setting. They're in a public employment setting, the, the, most of the public agencies and so forth have very strict rules. In a private employment setting, it is uh, you have to file suit in a federal court, uh, generally speaking, in most <coughs> states. And it's, it's a very uh, hard situation to, to prove and then to, to, to find out what the damages were. Uh, interestingly enough, the first two cases of sexual harassment that I did both involved female supervisors with male employees. And uh, I shared that with some attorneys around the state and they've been in practice for 20 years and never had that. But my first two were, uh, the victims were the, were the male employees. In both cases, the companies chose to settle. And this is the most common route that you end up with a settlement and usually the employee then leaves. It's a rare situation where the employee brings this, and, and this is the downside of, of labor law and of employment law. Usually the employee, if they do bring such an action, 
it, it's very difficult to stay on the job. Either the, their fellow employees may uh, resent what they did or kid them or something, or the employer almost unconsciously uh, has a different feeling about them. So it, it's a very difficult choice to make. Uh, do you accept this kind of harassment in the, the one you mentioned, sexual? Or do you uh, fight it and be prepared maybe to leave if you have to? Jim Hilbert. I'd like to get into the area of discrimination a little deeper. If you have a discriminatory action, and that can be either a disciplinary action or a termination, whatever, what are the kinds of things that the employee needs to show in order to build a case? So much of this depends upon the employment situation. Many employment, uh, uh, I won't say contracts, but many employers now have what they call handbooks, personnel handbooks, guidelines. They may call them a hand, any number of different terms, but it's basically a little book that they give to the employee when they the first day of work and the employee never looks at it again until they get into trouble and then they rifle through the pages looking for something. And that's a little bit of an overstatement, but that seems to me like that uh, that is what happens when I ask employees who come to me uh, about the handbook. They go, oh yes, there's a little pink book we got the first day. It's in my bottom drawer someplace, and they go get it. Uh, if the handbook has a, po a procedure, most courts insist that this procedure be followed completely through before any kind of action is taken. So for example, if you have a, an employee at a, well let's just make an employee at, at North Idaho College, since we're here. An employee at North Idaho College, their handbook has a very specific grievance policy that must be followed by all the employees, whether it's a janitor, an instructor, or anyone who's covered by that handbook. They have to go through certain steps. You cannot bypass those steps. That is true of companies like Louisiana Pacific, General Telephone, the hospital, colleges. I mean, it's just a very typical thing now. And, and most employment law specialists recommend to employers that they have these handbooks because it is a means of protection for them against just one lawsuit after another. If there is not a, a way for an employee to address a grievance except to go to court, that's going to get very expensive for the employer in a very short time. In, in most work situations, the employer, in my opinion, the, my experience has been that they truly don't want these things to happen. Most good employers do not want sexual harassment, discrimination, uh, comments made about somebody's ethnic origin. They don't want this. They want a happy workplace, productive workplace. So this is one way if they give the employees an opportunity to, to deal internally. The, the problem with the handbook is that many courts started interpreting the handbook as a contract of employment. If the handbook says you can be an employee of this company un unless you do the following things. And that becomes one of those lists like we used to leave for our children, don't do this and don't do that, but we forgot to say don't put beans in your ears. And you know, they did it. Well, employers started making these incredible lists of things that they didn't want the employees to do. And they realized that they could never list all the things that creative employees can come up with to do that they really don't want them to do. <laughs> and so they then started having in sort of catch-all phrases you know, uh, or other things. But, and that has become, that was a trap for several years for the employer because the employee would say, I didn't do any of those things. It's true that I splashed mud deliberately on the boss's daughter, but, but you know, <laughs> that wasn't in that list. <laughs> and so now, uh, the, the, to get around this, employers, I would encourage any employer to have what's called a, uh, uh, a, a clause in their contract that, or their handbook that says this handbook is not a contract and should not be construed. And most of the ones I read now, all the employers went to the same uh, seminars that I did because I see those now in almost every handbook. But uh, I, I think I kind of got beyond your question, Janelle. I'm sorry. You, you, what, what should the employer? I was talking about what you have to show to show discrimination. Okay. But uh, I'm sorry. I, a, I, a basic case, you have to show you're in a protected class, I take it. Right. And, uh, in particular class, and that there was a, a violation of, of this, uh, your rights in that mm -hmm. area. 
and that it was, uh, it doesn't have to be even deliberate, it doesn't have to be, it can be uh, uh, by a fellow worker. The company is still responsible. It doesn't have to be a supervisor. If two people are working on on an uh, assembly line and one of them uh, harasses a fellow employee, uh, the company and the, and the employee who is harassed complains about it and the company doesn't take any action. They are responsible just as if the owner of the company came down and did the same thing. Steve Sheen. I have a, a two-part question, Bob, and it, and it follows up on what you just said about employers. Uh, and I agree that I think most employers do want to do the right thing. Um, and I think most employees would rather be employed than sue their employer. Um, what recourses do the, do the two have? And, and when I talk about the employee specifically, uh, many don't have money for expensive litigation. Uh, is there a small claims court process or will most attorneys take uh, employment uh, suits like these on a contingency basis? And then turning that around, um, where can employers go to get more information to be sure that they're complying with, with all the applicable laws? Let me do that one first before right. that thesis. There are a number of, of seminars and conferences primarily aimed at employers. The very best one that I know about in this whole area is one in Seattle every May called the Pacific uh, Labor Law Conference. And it's held in the city of Seattle and it is designed by uh, the University of Washington Law School and the labor law section of the Seattle Bar. In, in, and it's for employees and employers. And in fact, mo mo most people that are there are employers, but they have a lot of labor union and a lot of employees representatives there. This is like a three-day conference and it has powerful speakers from around the country, Department of Labor, uh, Department of Civil Rights, Attorney General's Office, who come in and have wonderful lectures, uh, presentations of all kinds for the employer. That is one of the best ones that I know about. There are, however, a number of those around that different uh, groups put on. Right here locally in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, there is a Department of Employment put on a, a one recently on the Fair Labor Standards Act in which they brought a, a speaker in and, and I was I think the only attorney in attendance and most of the people were employers so there are a lot of those kinds of things. I think if you contact the Department of Labor uh, any employer could, could get that information. Now back to the other. Uh, I do a lot of what I call mediation work and I know other attorneys who do this kind of, of law do it as well. The problem with taking a, a case on contingency is that the contingent fee arrangement is usually where someone slips and falls, there's a lawsuit, if they recover $100,000 and the attorney gets 25%, he or she gets 25000 the injured party gets 75000 and everybody walks away happy except the owner of the lettuce leaf or whatever it may be. But in employment cases, it's quite different because if I get you your job back, or if I get you your promotion back, or whatever it was, what is 25% of your job back? Do I get 25% of your salary for the rest of your life? Do I get 25% of one year's salary? I mean, so on these, I usually suggest to the to clients, I think most attorneys do, is that on those kinds of cases, you're better off on an hourly basis. But it's a mediation, and, and what I do with many employers is I meet with the employer representing the, the wronged employee and say this employee really wants to stay here. They like their job. They feel that there was a misunderstanding. And basically I can remove the, uh, and I don't, when I say I, I mean anyone in my position, can remove the uh, uh, emotionalism that frequently crops up on these kinds of cases and just sort of talk it out with the employer. And if the employer really wanted this person back, those are successful. If the employee really wants to go back and if the employer really did make a mistake or, or the employee made a mistake, then I have some cases where those people five years ago, four years ago, and they're still working there. And so those are fairly inexpensive uh, mediation. And we have also in almost every city uh, local mediator, uh, mediators or, or centers for conflict resolution where again, this would be a, a more inexpensive way to deal with the problem. Many, much of the time, in my opinion, a lot of these questions are not true wrongs committed by someone deliberately. 
but misunderstandings that get out of hand that if they can be resolved, both the employee and the employer are better off. Bob, I have two questions that are very different. The first one is that for someone who's practiced like you have this area, and I didn't tell our viewers at the beginning that this is your area especially is labor law, and many attorneys do specialize in some particular area. Uh, and at the beginning of this eight-week series, uh, Ken Howard made that point, and in selecting a lawyer, it's very wise to get someone who specializes because they've already done a lot of the research and have the background. But taking advantage of your expertise while we have you here, uh, in cases where it goes to court, uh, a conflict between employer and employee, what is the history of track record? Do employers and employees both have a lot of documentation, or do, do, does a dispute arise and, and when you get into court you don't have a lot? In other words, sometimes, what is the paper trail in those cases usually? Uh, <clears throat> I've had a handful of clients walk into my office with an a incredible collection of records, uh, comments, you know, notes they made to themselves, things they've kept. I, I almost would like to say that I'm almost suspicious of some of those cases when they come in that well prepared because most of us don't do that in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. I, I applaud those people that do that, but I, I must say that I, I think that I'm a little bit suspicious when somebody comes in, you know, have they really planned this? Because a case like that is difficult to sell to a jury if it appears that the person really set out to deliberately set up a situation where they would be fired and then do it. But we're, the, we're signaled for not much time left, okay. but, but I'm just saying both the employer and employee, it's, it's in the minority cases that they have that kind of documentation, right? The employer has all the documentation, usually, and, and the, the employee, employee doesn't, doesn't, but under discovery rules, we can't get it. So with less than two minutes, uh, something else that I want to get on the air, and that has to do with class action. We haven't talked about that. In some cases, uh, there's a group of employees that sue. Is that mm -hmm. correct? That's true. and. Uh, I have a case right now involving uh, a large corporation, nationwide corporation, where a number of people were let go under a suspicious, at least what appeared to be a suspicious cat uh, category. And so I'm in contact with some people in Pocatello and in Boise who were let go in similar situations, and there will be, I think, a class action suit filed. So yes, that is very... But that does happen from time to it time. It does happen. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got the signal that we're out of time, and on behalf of Janelle Burke and Steve Schink and our staff, Bob Brown, thank you for being with us. It's been a very, very informative program, thank and you. thank you for taking the time. Ladies and gentlemen, with this program, we end eight-week series entitled Know the Law. Uh, next week, we're going to turn to a totally different subject, uh, and it's unusual that we have series that last this long. In many weeks, it's a different subject each week, and I hope you will join us again next week when we discuss another significant issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.